Hi, my name is Paul Grogan and welcome to episode 59 of the Gaming Rules Podcast. In this episode, I'm joined by Zev Schlesinger, all the way from sunny Florida, talking about his role in the games industry and how he got there. This podcast has been created thanks to my Patreon backers, so thank you to everybody who's listening. And if you are a regular listener and want to support my channel, then please consider supporting me at patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. And also thanks to everyone who nominated this podcast for a Golden Geek Award. Voting is now open, so if you enjoy this content, please head on over to BoardGameGeek and cast your vote. And as always, thanks to the sponsors of the show, GamesLaw, the UK's largest specialist games retailer at gameslaw.com. And now, on with the show. So, welcome to the show, Zev. Thank you for having me, Paul. Now, I invited you onto this show probably 18 months ago, I think. <laughs> it's been a while. We were chatting at Origins and I said, oh yeah, I'd like to bring you on the show as a, as a guest. I think it was even before you joined WizKids, I can't remember. But we finally made it happen. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. So, um, the first part, when I normally interview people, is I get them just to say a little bit about themselves. So, who is... Zev. Uh, well, currently I'm the director of board games uh, at WizKids. Uh, prior to that, I founded uh, Z-Man Games. And uh, prior to that, I was uh, heavy into collectible card games, which got me more into the industry. And prior to that, I've been board gaming uh, most of my life. Okay. And where, if you don't mind sharing just a little bit of personal information, whereabouts do you live? Uh, I live in Naples, Florida. And you moved there recently, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I'm here in about uh, about four years or so uh, from uh, New York. I just <laughs> We moved because we couldn't take the weather anymore. No more cold or snow. Well, as we're recording this, we're currently, most of the UK is covered in snow. I'm, I'm not, down in Devon. Oh, nice. We're fine here. It's blue skies, no snow nice. at all. But the rest of the UK is, because uh, we get one inch of snow and that's it. The whole country comes to a standstill. Of course, because you guys are not prepared for it. <laughs> well, we, we used to <laughs> yeah. laugh growing up in New York because we have you know, a fleet of salt trucks. So when snow comes, we're like, okay, all right, let's get the fleet out and the plows and everything. But when you're in a, in a place that normally doesn't have it, you have maybe one truck. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, nope, everybody stay home. It's bad out. <laughs> even with a, yeah. even with a light, uh, 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 what do you call it? A drizzle or something. An icy yes. drizzle. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad we've talked about the weather because that's, that's a traditional thing that we do in England. We just talk about the weather all the time. That's true. Um, <laughs> let's go back to life before Z-Man then. Oh. So you okay. mentioned collectible card games, and I know that you were a big fan of Shadow Fist. Correct. Oh, absolutely. Huge fan. <laughs> so huge, that's why I started Z-Man. <laughs> right, but you, you actually played competitively in tournaments, I believe? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, I, not, I played uh, in a lot of tournaments, and I also ran a lot of tournaments, plus I helped uh, playtest uh, uh, some of that stuff. Nice. Oh, yeah. And you got into Shadow Fist... Was that the first CCG that you got into? No, it was Magic, Magic the Gathering. Right. January 94, uh, I, I, I went up to a, a game store. I drove an hour to a game store to participate in a role-playing game, and the game master, uh, the DM, did not show up, so I was not happy. And then the people at the store, you know, blessed them. They said, well, you're here, you want to do something else? And they showed me Magic the Gathering, and I was hooked. Yep. So, uh, so I ended up playing that, and uh, not only that, I started uh, demonstrating the game, and I and I ran tournaments. You're a little bit like me. You can't just do something, correct, and just enjoy it. You, you've got to go. Oh right, I enjoy that. Right, I'm gonna get in contact with them, and I'll start running tournaments, and I'll I'll do this, and I'll do that. So um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So before before that, it was role playing games. Then was that your thing? Uh, no, I was actually getting back into it. I was. Uh, I, I had played. Look, I. I I learned Dungeons and Dragons when I was 12. Right. Uh, so uh, and I played on and off, and I played in some campaigns on and off. And there was a hiatus. I didn't play for a while. And then I heard about this store uh, was running stuff. And I said, you know, let, let me try to get back into it. So we had the first session where we made characters. And, man, I don't even know if we actually went further than that and then i went again <laughs> and it's like man the guy didn't show up and that was it uh i don't think i may have played one or two sessions years and years after that at a convention just you know like little one shot kind of yeah. things uh I, I like it i you know i like R rpgs very much i love the uh uh the thing but uh, to me you need a good uh, game master a good dm if you don't yeah, have yeah, yeah. that you know it's it's flat any any game system can uh, succeed or fail depending on the gm yes Re really yeah you know i've, I've played role-playing games from you know 
Dungeons and Dragons 3.5 with you know 500 pages of rule books, playing <laughs> absolutely by the rules. I've also played a role-playing game with two pages of rules, which was very, very abstract and freeform. And both of those situation, both of those games in the right conditions with the right people and the right GM were great experiences. But without the right GM, it can just be a total disaster. Oh, absolutely. So. I mean, look, I could even, you know, I, I even remember some of the things that I did that first session I ever played. Uh, and it, it still stuck with me because the guy was great and the story was great and we had some, you know, fantastic action and, and uh, things that were happening. So, yeah, it's memorable. It's it's yeah. stories. You know, that's what it is. Yeah. You started with D&D around the same time as me. I was, I was either 12 or 13. I can't quite remember now, but that was the time when I... Uh, first got into Dungeons and Dragons with the basic edition with the red box. Yeah, way, oh. way back in, way back then. So anyway, <laughs> right. How did Shadow Fist then turn into Z-Man? Well, so uh, as I said, I was uh, I demonstrated a lot of CCGs, uh, and actually I was mm -hmm. part of a group called Arcane Circle, where we uh, we had a group of about. I don't know, about six, seven, eight of us, and we all did various things. Some of us were still magic uh, uh, um, uh, judges and, and demonstrators, and, and we got contacted by other people to demonstrate their CCGs. So I got into okay. Legend of the Five Rings. I got into, yep. uh, uh, heck, I played Mythos. I played, I, I mean, I had a box with a bunch of, of games. So uh, Shadow Fist, I learned in... Uh, I think at Origins 95, they had a table there. And actually, at the time, I was teaching Dragon Dice for TSR. Yeah, um, I've, and they I remember had, that. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was interesting. Uh, so the, uh, the Shadow Fist people, Daedalus Entertainment, they didn't even man their table. They just had Shadow Fist cards <laughs> strewn about their table. <laughs> so we would always walk over there and go and like, you know, and grab some because they said it was free for the taking. So we would grab, grab some and show it to everybody. Say, oh my God, look at this card. Uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, Carfi. Oh, look, a neutron bomb. Oh, look, this. And it was so cool. And, um, then we got to, uh, learn the game from, uh, some of the designers. And the owner of the company, uh, we played in the lobby right outside the exhibit hall. And uh, yeah, and from there I was hooked uh, playing Shadow Fist. I really liked it. So that became my focus uh, as, um, uh, you know, going to shows and stuff, demonstrating uh, Shadow Fist. Uh, yeah. Even though I was still doing a little bit of other games, I was still doing some TSR stuff. And I might even been helping out at Magic uh, at the time. Yeah, I, in fact, I definitely was because in 96... When the first Pro Tour, I was one of the judges in the first Pro Tour oh, cool. of Magic the Gathering. So, yeah, so I was still doing all that stuff, but Shadow Fist was definitely the game I glommed onto. So, what happened was after the company went out of business in 97, uh, even my friends and I, we were still going to shows, and in the evenings, we'd pull out our Shadow Fist decks and start playing. And, every, and, and no kidding, every show, Every time we did this, people would come up to us, like slap their foreheads and say, man, I didn't know people would be playing Shadow Fist. I would have brought my cards. Yeah. So this happened to such, you know, a, an immense point, a critical mass, I guess. I turned to my friend. I said, you know, why don't we try to bring this back and, and you know, and, and get new cards out and everything. And that was the seed of starting Z-Man Games. And is that, did Z-Man then publish Shadow Fist? Uh, yeah, that was uh, the first uh, thing we published. We, right. fo we formed Z-Man in 99 and the, f the first starter and booster set came out in Gen Con uh, 2000. And what is, the, what is currently going on with Shadow Fist? Is it still in print? Uh, yes and no. It's uh, It's been sold to a fan of the game many years ago, and that person, I think it's called Inner Kingdom Games, uh, they've run uh, uh, Kickstarters for the various sets, and I've, I've okay. backed them all. And unfortunately, he uh, they, they ran one, I think about two or three months ago. I, I backed it, but it did not fund. So I don't right. know if he's going to... Uh, redo it or or what? I'm not sure. So I guess it's in flux. But if it comes back out, it's probably the only Kickstarter stuff I I back. Uh, you know, maybe you know some friend stuff here and there. But for Shadow Fist, I will gladly get new cards. Excellent. Um, yeah, I mean, back in the day, I was a, a DCI level three judge as well, and I was I was judging Pro Tools because, like you, as I say, you know, when you get into something you then want to get deeper into it. So Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but I gave up Magic in the very late 90s, so it was about 98, 99 for me, when all I was doing was Magic. I'd, I'd stopped role-playing, I'd stopped board gaming, I'd stopped <laughs> everything. It just completely took over my life. And I wasn't actually that good at it, and I was getting more and more frustrated that I wasn't that good at it, 
that the frustration overcame the enjoyment. And one day I just went, I'll tell you what, this is silly and stopped. And that was oh, it. wow. I, you know, I had almost, I had, a, uh, well, I had a different re- experience. My thing was I was tired of people playing the same, like two or three decks. You'd go to a right. tournament and, uh, you know, the, the people would post their, their decks on the internet and the top two or three with every set would be posted and that's all people would play. Nobody was, or, or very little from what I saw was, uh, being creative, uh, and trying to make their own things because of the tournament thing. It became a matter of winning, 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 winning and not fun. Yeah. And that's why yeah. I, I pretty much stopped uh, playing the game when things become too competitive. And exactly. as you say, you know, back in back in the day when we started and we were playing like multiplayer and we were all just building random decks, it was great. And then when when I got seriously into it and started playing at a competitive level, it was a different kind of enjoyment. And it, it you know, if you turned up to any competitive event with, you know, some fun deck you'd thrown together, you you know, you're just going to lose every game. But Playing at very high levels with very, very good decks was a different experience. The problem for me, and I didn't mind that, the problem for me is when I'd go home and I'd be just more angry with myself and I'd be worried about my ranking and I thought, hang on a minute, this this, this is not fun anymore. Yep. So anyway, yep. going back to Z-Man. Yes. So when did Z-Man get formed again? Uh, 1999. And when did you leave Z-Man? Uh, well, so I sold the company in 2011 but yep. I still worked for them for four and a half years. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't officially leave until uh, January 2016. So that's 17 years, 16, 17 years that you uh, were That's about, them. yeah, yeah. And during that time, they did a lot of games. Uh, oh, yes. Or you we, did a lot of games. Yes, <laughs> yes, we did. Uh, yes, I did, yes. Uh, I think, I think all together, by the time I left, we published probably uh, over 200 games. Probably like uh, 220 or something like that. And you had a lot of publishing partners. Uh, So I know you did a lot of the games from CGE, which is how I got to know you. Yep, yep, yep. CGE, Portal, Amigo, uh, um, uh, uh, Fjordland. Yeah, a whole whole bunch of uh, many, uh, a lot from Japan. uh, You know, uh, Kawasaki Factory and things like that. Japan brand. Uh, yeah. representatives, uh, of clients of theirs. Uh, but yeah, we worked with many, many partners. My goal was always to do something. It wasn't exactly 50, 50, but trying to be where we would do 50 licensed stuff and 50% original things. Right. Okay. Now I don't want to ask you any probing questions about the time when you left Z-Man, but, um, one of the questions in from people, Michael Logan wants to ask you, do you have any regrets about selling Z-Man? Um, Maybe, uh, you know, teeny tiny every so often, you know, you always, you always think about, hmm, what would have happened if Should I continued, I have, yeah. you know, or if I waited a few more years, hey, you know, uh, maybe uh, I would have been bought out then by asthma day, right? <laughs> if I waited right. three, four years. Uh, so yeah, a little bit in that I was interested, it would have been interesting to see where I would have gone from there. But to me, it was the right decision at the time, even though I wasn't looking to sell. It was an opportunity that came to me and, you know, I thought about it. Uh, you know, I didn't do it right away. It was just something I thought about. I talked it over uh, with friends, with my, with my wife and stuff, and we thought it was, it was a good deal at the time. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask you a question now, and if you don't want to answer this one, I will just edit this bit out of the podcast. Sure. But at the point when you sold Z-Man, were you then planning to leave? No. <laughs> I, I was let go. Right. It, it's, it's no, no, you know, I'm not hiding it. I was let go. They felt they didn't need me anymore. And right. that was like, okay. So that was it. Okay. You know. So, uh, yeah. So it wasn't part of the plan that you would sell and then you would leave. It was you would sell and stay on. Well, but we, then. I, well, I had a three year contract, right? Okay. Uh, and then we both had the opportunity of, with escape clauses. And we also had the opportunity, of course, to not renew. But even after the three years, I still worked for them for 18 more months. We had talked about. Hey, let's renew the contract. Let's renew the contract. You know, I wanted a few things, da da da. And then they were they were uh, delaying, delaying, delaying. And then finally, uh, I think in December or so, or right after, yeah, like very early December, uh, I said, "Look, what, what's going on?" And they said, "Hey, you know, I, we think it'll be better if you uh, uh, if you depart." Uh, we don't, you know, we, we don't, uh, I don't know if it's saying they didn't need me or they, th- yeah, they didn't need me anymore, I guess. That was it. Okay. I went, okay, uh, that was it. Yeah. 
I mean, that must have been a particularly difficult time considering Z-Man was, was yours and you'd, you'd built it up. But at the end of the day, as you say, you'd, you'd made the decision to sell it. Therefore, it kind of wasn't yours anymore. Right, right. But I still felt very attached to it. That's why I yeah, made no exactly. plans to leave. If they, want, if they had kept me on, I would have gladly stayed on. So I wasn't yeah. looking to leave. Okay. So now let's move on to WizKids. How did that come about? So I announced everybody that I was leaving uh, effective like mid-January. Uh, so this was in December, I believe. I posted that uh, come mid-January, I will be, uh, you know, f- free. And yeah. that the day that I posted, I got a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails. <laughs> I'm not uh, surprised. So, so honestly, I mean, it, it, I, I kind of feel good about that. I mean, I could have had yeah. a job that day, actually. Um, mm-hmm. But I weighed my uh, my options, and uh, WizKids was one of them, and I decided to go with them. So I, I signed on with them uh, officially uh, January, I think, 27th. So about uh, almost two weeks after my official leave from Z-Man. And just explain to people what your role is at WizKids. You said you're director of board games. Yeah, it's, it's a title, right? Uh, but, uh, yeah, but what but, do you do? But ba- yeah, my job is finding, developing, and bringing to market board games. I'm building up the WizKids board game catalog. Mm-hmm. Now that is what you did at Z-Man. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So you're, you're getting to do all of that all over again. Yes. With WizKids. <laughs> yes, with, my, with the same philosophy uh, and with the addition of being, uh, uh, having uh, some you know, interesting and cool licenses available to me. Yeah. Now, this is a leading question because I've already spoken to you about this personally. But yes. for those people who are listening, um, what level of control do you have at WizKids, have they pretty much given this to you to do and then you just go and do it? Or are you operating within stricter boundaries than you used to? Uh, I have pretty much, uh, I have very much control. Uh, as yeah. long as I don't, as long as I don't do something crazy, uh, <laughs> and if I did, I'd have, or if I tried to, that I would have to uh, talk with uh, uh, the bosses. And that's something like, hey, I want to do a 10,000 print run of this game. I would have to, uh, I'd have to validate the reasons for doing that. Yes. Uh, so in that way, I don't have uh, the uh, that power. And the other thing is, as long as I'm within the margins that they assign me, I'm I'm pretty much free to do uh, okay. you know anything, which is great. That's good. I mean, WizKids as a board game company, they've dabbled they dabbled before. Yes. But they've never really done it as a as a big thing. It's sort of been like a, maybe a side project or an afterthought. Whereas getting you in to do this was obviously a change in direction at WizKids that they went, right, we're actually now going to start doing more board games. Exactly, exactly. And were they planning to do that and then looking for the right person? Or did they see that you were looking for work and think, oh, if we get Zev in, we can now do this? Do you know? Um, I think they were... I think they were interested. Well, you know what? It's it's a matter of they're very good at looking at opportunities. Uh, mm-hmm. And yeah, they probably wanted a, a nice focus of board games. But I think, and, and actually even before I had spoken with uh, Justin, who's uh, one of the bosses, he had asked me many times yep. if, if I could help find games for him and so on. I said, no, look, I, I'm okay. with Z-Man. I can't. So I know they were sort of interested. Uh, so yeah, definitely my announcement was basically, okay, they had to pull the trigger. If we're going to be serious about doing board games, Zev is here. Here's the opportunity. The only other yeah. thing they would have done possibly is buy another company, right? Another board game right. company and, and have them uh, do it. But my, my, being, my announcement made that opportunity come to pass. Okay. Um, and I don't, know if you've, I don't know if you've listened to the last Gaming Rules podcast, but we talked about the Gaming Rules plan to buy out um, Asmodee and then buy WizKids. <laughs> so just to, let, just to let you know, you'll be in a... In a I've collected $111 so far. <laughs> and basically, once I've got enough to buy Asmodee, it was because there was a whole discussion about sidereal confluence. And I don't think I've had this discussion with you um, no. in private, but there are some fairly major parts of sidereal confluence which are an exact um i'm not going to use the word copy or replica they are the same as a game i designed which WizKids were interested in 
many, many years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, only, only a bit of it, right? <laughs> so we joked on the podcast and my guest on the time said, so basically you're saying that they stole your game and you're suing them. And I was like, no, 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 I'm just going to save up and buy him out. Anyway, that was a quick summary of what happened last time. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you about it at some point. The open trading aspect of sidereal confluence and the way that the companies can, you can lend individual parts of your company to somebody else for them to run it and stuff like oh, that. Wow. That's what I had in mind. Um, and of course, I never really did anything with mine because it wasn't actually that good. Um, and it, it was only a small part of it. But yeah, next time I see you, I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about it. Yes, please um, do. <laughs> so gaming questions for me. What are your favorite games, your sweet spot of complexity, length, and the kind of games you like playing other than Shadow Fist? Uh, I, look, I, I like playing any type of games. I rarely say no to a game. I'll try it. Um, but uh, I do like games that have story. Uh, okay. uh, and, and just, you know, even within the game, not, doesn't ha actually have to have story. Uh, although yeah. things, something like Tales of the Arabian Nights, I love, right? Cause that is story. Uh, okay. but one of my favorite games is Tissue. Yep. So, uh, you know, I love that. And actually somebody said, Hey, but that's not story. And I, my knee jerk reaction was, well, okay, well, you know, I love the game. And then I thought about it. And I go, you know, that's not true because even to this day, you know, I talk about some of the plays that I saw and that I did. Right. So it's like, that is story. That is, okay. you know, something that you tell. Remember when I, you know, I took this card and I was able to do this and that. And when we did, you know, so I, I love that kind of stuff. But honestly, I don't look for uh, particular games. There may, there may be games I avoid if I can. But yeah. I, I like all, I usually like all kinds of games. And I, I'll play card games. I'll play board games. I'll play gamer games. I'll play, you know, uh, uh, family games. I, I don't mind. Yeah. I'm very eclectic in that way. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the last sort of three or four years, we've had more story-driven games than ever before. So yes. it must be a good time for, you know, I'm, I'm thinking things like uh, Time Stories and yep. all of the new legacy games, which are like just campaign games, but with ripping things up. Um, all of that sort of stuff. Absolutely. It's a good time. It is, I yeah. think. Right, let's move on to some questions from other people. So this is a question in from a friend of mine, Chris, and he wants to know, will you work together with Andrew Parks and finish the real world set for the Nightmare Before Christmas TCG? Now, I don't know anything about this, so <laughs> is there something behind this? Uh, no, there, no, we're not going to finish it. Uh, okay. And honestly, I was opposed to it being a CCG. It should have been a standalone. Uh, right. But... They they wanted to cash in on the, uh, you know, on the CCG thing because uh, there was a, a renaissance in 2000, not only with Shadow Fist, but, you know, Raw Deal. Because I don't know if you know, I was also the gaming manager for the Raw Deal collectible card game. I did not know. So, right, okay. <laughs> yes, I worked for Comic Images while working at Z-Man Games. So, right. Uh, but, yeah, so 2000 was the new renaissance of CCGs, but, uh, so we, uh, which is kind of interesting. So that means doing the Nightmare Before Christmas. So I worked for NECA prior to them buying WizKids for many years right. before that. So this was going to be a thing, but then didn't become a thing. Is that right? Yeah, I, I don't even know about the New World. I assume you mean some sort of expansion. I don't even remember an expansion like that being called. We only did the Christmas Town expansion. Uh, and then beyond that, I, I, I think, yeah, it just didn't do well. Uh, but the okay. sorters sold like crazy. That's why if it was a non-CCG, I think we would have done a lot better. Right. Okay. Next question is uh, another friend of mine, Chewy. Chewy had the privilege of meeting you at the UK Games Expo back when it was at the Clarendon Suites. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the tiny little hotel in the middle of Birmingham. Yep. And then he met you again at Gen Con when you were in your WizKids role. And he wants to know how you think the market has changed today working with WizKids compared to the period when you were running Z-Man Games. So... Yeah, how has it changed? Maybe in the last sort of ten years or so. Uh, definitely, the the barrier of entry has gone down. Hence, the proliferation of games that are out there. Uh, so I think, so you know, it's a double edged sword, right? It's a good thing because wow, that means board games are in vogue, right? People are playing, people are buying board games. Board games are mm -hmm. in the mainstream, and that's awesome. But the, the downside to that is, well, you know, if you have 4,000 games coming out in a year, it's hard to rise above that. Uh, yeah. And that's – so in that way, it's changed um, to, you know, fighting for for the minds of the consumers, the wallets of the consumers. Uh, so in that way, it's hard. But again, the fact that that there are more consumers out there is is very nice. 
but yeah, it's 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 tough. A lot different yeah. than when Z Man uh, had started out. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, when you say barriers to entry, you mean that games are becoming more accessible and aimed at a more family or gateway uh, audience. That and 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 mostly actually to to um, produce a game. Uh, and especially, obviously, Kickstarter is a big thing of that, right? Where right. you don't even have to put up your own money. Some, you know, other people will fund it, and you know, yeah. and then you're using their money already to fund the game. So that barrier, uh, basically, your risk is nearly zero, you know, if right. not zero with Kickstarter. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's it's changed dramatically. And again, there's a there's a good way of looking at, it, and there's a bad way of looking at it. So it's all uh-huh. a matter of your perspective and you know what side of the uh, the coin that you're you're on. Now, just touching on something that you said earlier on, uh, another question in from Christian. He wants to know your thought on Japanese games, because you mentioned that Z-Man did publish some Japanese games, and Christian's saying that Z-Man was one of the first companies to import some of the cool Japanese games while you were still there. Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting. I uh, Look, I still love it. I love some of their designs. Uh, and actually, I just uh, we're releasing Spy Tricks or Trick of Spy, which was a, a Japanese game. Uh, you know, Susumu Kawasaki. Um, yep. What's interesting, I think there was a. Uh, I'm not going to say a glut, but there was a plethora of of Japanese games that have been coming out. But I think it slowed down, and and I could be wrong. But the perception I have is that they're not coming out as much as I thought they would after the gates opened uh, okay. for their entry. Uh, but I think they're cool. And, you know, you'll see, you know, you'll see some publishers who bring a lot of those games in there. Um, and, of course, at Essen, you know, Japan brand, you know, they have long lines as people buy up uh, the games the that they bring in. The 200 copies that are available. Exactly, yeah. exactly, all that <laughs> stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's still a, a thing, but... Interesting that it had is not it's not taken over I guess like the Euro games or stuff like that have uh, in the past. So you're saying it stayed at the size that it kind of has been for a while, and you uh, thought it little, might no, have... I think it's a little bigger, but not not hugely uh, uh, as popular or, right. or as big as I thought it could be based on how many years have gone by since I started bringing in stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm, I could turn around and look at my collection, and I'm like. And I'm counting the the number again. I got quite a lot of games that I brought in uh, from Japan. Um, so it's and now it's spread among a, bu- a bunch of different publishers. But I don't know if it's as much as that I had brought in over the years. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, right. Moving on to the next question. So this is in from Jack, and he's talking about this is Wizkid specific stuff here. Sure. Um, do Wizkids plan to introduce more pre-painted minis in their games? Because you already did quite a lot. I think. Uh, yeah, well, what we did is we started having uh, standard and premium editions. I think we started that right. with Assault of the Giants uh, and then Tomb of Annihilation. Uh, so I will say that, uh, yes, uh, some of the games that we will be doing will always have, um, or will be striving to offer a painted version, uh, painted minis, uh, either as that's the only version or having the standard and premium version again where the premium version offers uh painted pre-painted uh figs so you'll right. see a, a few announcements that will be coming out over the next few months and then you'll see that happening so i can tell probably on one two three uh at least four other products that will have either painted uh, painted versions in either standard in either the the base form or in a premium form okay and the pre uh the pre-painted minis, are they gonna be of a similar quality to previous pre-painted minis, or are they gonna be of a better quality? I don't know. I mean that's really right. a subjective thing. I I mean obviously we're striving for the the best quality we can get and can afford within the game. So, you know, we never say, hey, slap on a, a piece of paint and you know, haha, we're tricking everybody, it's called pre-painted yeah. and we did one coat. No, there's a lot of work that goes in these. And of course, we hope that it's a good job. Uh, we do go with printers who use, uh, I, I, yeah, we go with printers, factories, whatever, that uh, have the ability, the capability of doing painted figs. So yeah, the, the, we're always striving to have the best quality we can within the, uh, 
uh, the framework of the game. I mean, people have to understand it. And honestly, this is new to me too because at Z-Man, I didn't do this. No, no, no. It's all new stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm learning this as all uh, as well. Um, and it's it's not easy to. I, I mean, the level of paint. Right, obviously it increases because it's the amount of work, the amount of time uh, involved, the labor uh, cost. So you could, uh, and you know, you can have, hey, let's paint this, this, the eyes, you know, this, this, and then let's add five colors, make it ten colors, make it, you know, yeah, the, yeah it all adds to it. So you have to really weigh the costs of how much you can do versus. Um, you know, again, what the cost of the game is. Yeah, we want to keep the price points of games to a manageable level or to a correct level, uh, and you have to watch that with the painted versions. Yeah. Okay. So another question, and again, we can we can cut this one if you're not comfortable with with the answer. But um, this came in from a few people, and they talked about WizKids having a reputation for sometimes having um, subpar component qualities, and if you have been able to influence that and try and improve that during your time there um well so yes i understand there is the rep there and actually i didn't know about it much until i joined whiz kids and then started hearing about it more right okay uh, so my goal has been to obviously improve that perception and again i say a perception right this is subjective uh mm -hmm. but yes they they probably had yes they did have issues in the past i think yeah. that is less frequent now uh i know uh, you know, some uh, reviews here and there have pointed to some uh, quality issues. Uh, but for the most part, we've been getting better press on that. I mean, if you look at a yeah. game like Approaching Dawn, The Witching Hour, I mean, nobody has complained about the quality there. Deadline, you know, I, I don't think I've heard any uh, issues there. So, no, and I own a copy of, well, I don't own a copy. It's a, it's a friend's copy, but I have a copy of Deadline in the house and I can confirm Component quality is absolutely fine. If, if we go back to um, Star Trek Expeditions, right, from years ago now, what ten years yes. ago, something yeah. like that. Oh, uh, yeah. The cards, the cards were paper thin. Yep. I mean, literally, it was it was only just thicker than the, the normal paper. <laughs> I agree. Um, yep. So it's things like that, and and that to me is like, well, surely anybody who's produced any kind of board games wouldn't have done that, or there was some kind of miscommunication with the factory or whatever, but. It's things like that. And and the cards in Deadline are absolutely fine. They're really good, thick, you know, standard card stock. So, so, and, and so I'll tell you a funny thing. So I, I heard at least one of, one person, maybe two, they said, oh, they didn't like the card stock in The Expanse, right? Right. And it's like it was the same factory and the same card stock as the people who did Deadline. So okay. it's... Again, so you see it's subjective That's now. That's where it becomes subjective, Exactly. Yes. So if do they have deadline? And did they say deadline was, oh, these cards are great, but hey, expanse cards are not? Do they not have it? So it would be interesting to, f to find somebody who has deadline and then has expanse and then says, yep, the cards are you know, both bad or both good, whatever. Yep. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, my job is obviously to uh, improve the quality. We've been using different factories uh, for... Uh, right for uh, most of the games, factories that, that uh, WizKids had not used previously. And these are people that I used when I was running Z-Man games. Um, okay, well, that's good to hear. That that's Yeah. yeah. Uh, and look, do things happen? Absolutely. But it's not production-wide, right? I mean, we've, had, we've got, been called to task when this has been bad or this has been bad. So it's really, it's what do we do to address the issue should, which should increase or decrease our rep? That, yeah. that's and thing. I think, I think you know. what you've just said is you've come on board and you've now started switching production to some of the factories that you used to use at Z-Man. Exactly. That's, that's it. If, if, if that's the answer to the question I think that, that people wanted to hear. Yes. And that's, that's good news. Thank you. So that should, should turn around. Yes. Excellent. Right. More questions. In from Marcus. Question one. Why did the second edition of Aura et Labora never make it to the UK? Uh, that I can't answer. I don't know. Uh, that, that was a time I was not in control of Z-Man. So I was going to say, that was only a couple of years ago, wasn't it? I uh, yeah, I think it was... 
Uh, yeah, I think it was like right after I sold, I think, or at, Le- at Labora came out. Beyond that, uh, at that point, I was not making any production decisions. I was advising, but I was not in control of that. My job was, yeah. again, finding games, developing games, and, you know, getting them. Uh, uh, and actually, at that point, not even production. That I then handed off the game. Or basically, I said, here's a game I think we should do. And then, aside from advice or anything like that, that's where it left my control after I sold Z-Man games. So, sorry, that I cannot answer. Can't answer that. And I know specifically you said, please, can you print a copy of this and send it to the UK for Marcus, but they didn't listen to you. So, no, they did not. <laughs> you know, what can you do? Question two. Now, this is an interesting one. Marcus wants to know, how come you always manage to get the number of copies printed so wrong? <laughs> so Which is a this bit, is, uh, <laughs> So this was a complaint after... <laughs> Wait, this was a complaint <laughs> after I sold the company, and it really had to do with a, a the philosophy of the new owner. So I, right. I so I can't really answer that. But the one thing sure. that I will answer because I did post this to explain to people. So uh, and I think, I, I, or at least I bet he might be uh, having a nod to Robinson Crusoe on this uh, because okay. I think that's where it came out more than most. So. Just to, to give people a process, right? Someone shows us a game, right? In this case, Portal, our partner. We said, hey, Robinson Crusoe, hey, very good. Yeah, we're interested. We're going to do it. You're our partner. We like the game. We tested it. Cool. So we're going to do our standard, you know, 2,000 or 3,000 print run, whatever. Yep. So we work on it. We're doing all this stuff. And then we put in an order for, for the game. Then the game all of a sudden gets so hot that – Orders exceed our production run. But the problem yep. is we've already ordered our I know. thing yeah. and we can't change it because the factory has already ordered the stock. They can order more in that, but it won't be done at the same time. So we there's nothing we can do about it, right? We don't know what, what mm-hmm. game is going to be hot. We can only guess at that. But at the point we said we were going to do, for this example, Robinson Crusoe, there was no buzz about the game. So we have to go in blind, and, and people don't realize that most of our decisions are months before yeah. a game comes out. So we don't know. We can only guess at certain things. But if we guess wrong, guess what, people? We may go out of business, and then you get no games from us. Yeah. So would you <laughs> rather us be right and therefore do reprints, and yes, there's a delay, or be wrong and financial disaster strikes? Yeah, it, it, it's it's this, you know one of the same things with the success of the first printing of Gloomhaven, and the amount of accusations that were flying around that Isaac deliberately went out of his way to only print a minimal number of copies of a game, in order to keep stock low, in order to raise hype and anticipation. The guy is a one man business, and he printed ten thousand of them. Right. See, what, so you it, can't win, right? What, <laughs> you can't, I mean, look, how was he supposed to know? <laughs> exactly. I mean, I knew it was a good game, but not that. Right, especially in this insane. marketplace. Absolutely. Look, if I get, if you guys can guarantee that, hey, print this game, we know it will sell 20,000, I will gladly print 20,000 <laughs> of every game that comes out if I know I can sell it. But I don't know I can sell it, so yeah. I would not risk it. But that's why we do reprints, right? Reprints, once yeah. we knew that we were selling out quickly, we pull the trigger on a reprint immediately. But it still takes time. And then you it get delays. Takes months. You know, right? Yeah. I mean, we had dice, right? At that time, I think the dice manufacturer, I think one had gone out of business, so we had to find the print, the factory had to find another one. I mean, you got yep. all these components that you have to source. The factory usually doesn't have everything there. They have to outsource a lot of components, dice, wood, plastic, you know, it depends on the on the specialty of the factory. So yep. you're, you know, you're in competition with other people who want custom dice or regular dice or wood pieces. And especially as you come around Essen time, you know, the factories are running, you know, like tw- probably 24 <laughs> seven and you can, yeah. and, and everybody even says, I just got my games a day before Essen because there's everybody's rushing like the last week or two. So, but, yep. but honestly, people, if we knew we could sell X amount, we would absolutely print X amount and then even more because we always try yeah. to do either our standard runs or like 25% of what our uh, more than what our pre-orders are if, the, if they're at a certain level. And that's the thing. We had no knowledge on pre-orders, no knowledge on buzz. So it's, it's a guessing game. Yeah. And I assume that in those 200 or so games that you said you'd published while at Z-Man, it's gone the other way and you've printed too many. Absolutely. Or has that never happened? Absolutely. It, it has. 
So imagine if if uh, this one man operation printed ten thousand games and he sold mm -hmm. one thousand or two thousand. Well, do you think he's going to be publishing another game with the loss of eight thousand nope. copies? No, of course okay. not. So why would you, you know, why would people force that? situation on others we're we're we are obviously making games because we love it but we are looking to make money so that we can make more games no one yes. is no one that i know is saying let me print less just to piss customers off and not That's make money it, it, it makes no I, sense i've heard that before you know <laughs> if you knew a game was going to sell ten thousand on the first print run you would make twelve thousand right? exactly you, you you wouldn't go oh well let's only make four Right. <laughs> you wouldn't do that. No, you, not you at don't all. Know. If I can guarantee 10,000, oh my Lord, I would do that all day, every day. Yeah. <laughs> right. Next comment in is from Jonathan. And he just wants to say that um, he's dealt with you, I don't know, emails or something like that. And he says, you're an absolute gent. No criticism. He's, got, he's not got any questions. He just wanted to say hello and said that he's spoken to you on, on occasions. And well, thank you. you. Brilliant. Thank so you there so we go. much. So, right. <laughs> next question. Uh, Andrew Jackson, spill the beans on the new D&D &D board game. <laughs> no. But he, he doesn't remember if that's Gale Force 9 or not. Because WizKids have the license to do the D&D &D board games. And uh, you mentioned a couple earlier on. Uh, yeah, we did some, but I, I think Gale Force 9 also has a license to do board games. And I right. believe they announced something recently. So oh, okay. we have so not. So it must be that. We have not. But we're doing another... Uh, we're doing another dungeon crawler like a Tomb of Annihilation. So we're doing yep. one based on the new storyline coming out uh, by like around Gen Con time. Right. So that's all I can okay. say, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Uh, David Cherry, uh, David Cherry, sorry, wants to know how Kickstarter has changed the publication industry, and you touched on this earlier on. Yes. Uh, so yeah, uh, you know, barrier to entry, no risk for publishers, and also marketing. Right. It seems that anything. Uh, on uh, anything on Kickstarter, for some reason, gets a little more visibility. It's uh, a shop front. Yeah, it's yeah. it's out there, and and it's funny because I went on uh, BoardGameGeek uh, dot com, and if you look at the hotness list, and it's not always there, but most of the top ten people, most of the top ten games, aside from it being from uh, a, a big company, uh, a well known company, it's usually a Kickstarter game. Yeah. So how do you, you know, it, it's like. You know, fighting tooth and nail, you know, fang and claw to get up there to get in people's minds. But yet, I oh, look, I'll put myself on Kickstarter, and oh look, people know about my game. It's, it's, it's all there. It's it's a little frustrating, but yeah, it's it's definitely changed because of that. I know, and you know, I've said on, about Kickstarter on on many occasions that there are the good sides of it, and there's bad sides. Correct. The good sides is you get the people. Uh, you know, like Isaac with Gloomhaven and like the guy who did um, Zaya, Legends of a Drift System, they're able to do something that would they would have never been able to do otherwise. They would have not been able to take that game to a publisher and any publisher pick it up. So, uh, Well, I'll say I'm, I'm a little more open to stuff like that. <laughs> I'm a little okay. crazy. I've taken chances. But no, you're right. And actually, that's my philosophy, my thing on, on Kickstarter. Uh, Kickstarter for me is about the dreamer, right? Somebody who wants to get the game, you know, their design, their work out there, and that's what it's for. I'm sort yeah. of opposed to the established publisher using it, mm -hmm. um, but I totally understand why they would. <laughs> yes. So I can't begrudge them that. Uh, but yeah, but you're right. I mean, uh, like uh, those, those two examples that you did, yes, for the most part, that was their way to do it. Uh, and, you know, some succeed, some don't. You never know. A couple of questions left. This one is in from Ben. How much influence do you have in the collectible game side of WizKids? None. So Dice Masters and Hero Clicks. Zero. That's not my department. Right. None at all. None at all. Right. Correct. So the the so the follow up questions uh, we we can't ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can, but the the answer will be I don't know. <laughs> right. Okay. Last question in then from Andy. If you could have a conversation with anybody from history, living or dead, who would it be and why? Oh man. I know. I <laughs> you have... wanted to know the board games question, didn't you? Yes. Uh... <laughs> well, you know, and it's also right. And, and right, this is not like a, a an unfamiliar question, right? People have asked this in the past, uh, and 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 while I've given it some thought, I've never really given it major thought. I, I honestly don't know who would I care so much about talking with, uh, and 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 why. Honestly, whew, man, that's a. That is a tough, tough call. You know, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, 
I, I have no idea. Maybe, you know, hey, maybe if this person existed, right? Let's say I, I would have talked to Eve, uh, you know, from okay. Adam and Eve and say, yeah, you know, don't eat that apple. Let's have something else to eat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, honestly. I, I don't. Uh, it, there's so many historical figures out there. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if there's anything I really need. Would it be a historical figure that you'd pick? Oh, actually, yeah. I mean, you could say, is that historical, right? I mean, so let's, uh, you know, there is, we won't go into that thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I probably, a, uh, I'm going to say maybe a scientist, some scientist. And okay. she, nah, you know, I wouldn't understand them at all, right? Uh, yeah, but it'd be cool. <laughs> it, I guess it would be cool, uh, I don't know, maybe hang out with Einstein a bit, um, you know, somewhat further. But no, honestly, I, 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 I really don't know. Uh, uh, and it might even be at a time that am I meeting them in my time or in their time? Because <laughs> then I would just if question. I go to their time, I would just sightsee or something and, and just see how <laughs> just have a look around. Yeah, have them. You know, I said, hey, give me a tour of your uh, of your country or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, if. In when you're having a shower later on today, because that's when I do my thinking. <laughs> so, something pops into your head. Let me know. Sure. And I'll and I'll pass the message pass the message on to Andy. Sure. <laughs> um, so to wrap things up, things that are coming out that you are allowed to talk about. Now I do a monthly live Q and A show, which goes out live, and it's extremely terrifying because literally people can ask me anything <laughs> while I'm sat there on camera and I answer it. And the one that I did for. The month of January, somebody posted a question in the chat and started talking about the Mage Knight Big Box Edition. Oh. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I, I didn't know this was known about. Yeah. And he's like, Pegas he's like yeah. Pegasus, Pegasus let it slip in a tiny sentence. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So he's, he basically said, oh, yeah, Pegasus has said that they're going to be doing the English version of the Mage Knight Big Box Edition. At which point I said, okay. Right. Well, <laughs> I guess if it's out there, then then there's a Mage Knight big box edition, and that's all I said. Um, <laughs> people have been pestering me for details. I've got crowds of people stood around my house constantly, <laughs> taking photos of me as I'm leaving. Uh, could be my imagination, but yeah, I, I'm I'm keeping keeping stum about it. Are you allowed to say anything? Um. Well, like you said, it's sort of out there. I think we're going to make an announcement the week of uh, the Gamma Trade Show. Right. Uh. So. I think in a few weeks it'll be there, but yeah, I'll confirm that. Yeah, we have we are working on the Mage Knight Ultimate the Mage Knight board game Ultimate Edition. So tune in, uh, tune in, stay, stay, yeah, stay on your social medias. Correct. Around the time of the Gamma Tray Show, and there'll be some announcements yes. about that then. Yes. Um, any other stuff that you're working on that you're allowed to say about that's particularly exciting at the moment? Uh, yeah, I mean a couple of things. Let's see. Um, there's a really beautiful game we're working on called Bumuntu. Uh, with uh, a uh, animals from the uh, the African uh, jungle around the Congo area, okay. and it's a sort of abstract. You're you're uh, you're letting the animals guide you. So when you land on an animal, if you use its movement uh, capabilities, you grab the tile and you're going for sets as well as trying to go for the more valuable uh, animals. And that value can change based on some of the tiles that are taken. Um, uh, so that's uh, something that's, I think, very exciting. That's going to be around Essen time. Uh, okay. And I think it's going to be very, I, 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 I'm going to say, very beautiful, uh, nice artwork and, and nice uh, components and everything. Right. Um, let's see what else. I mean, people know we got Spy Tricks coming out. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, we just released Team Play, which a lot of people have been asking about. Um, we have, let's just see... So I, I don't know if we announced it that, but we're doing a game called Arrive, okay, which is uh, in effect like Cthulhu Twister, <laughs> right? Okay, uh, which is which is going to be a lot of fun, I think. Um, and uh, you know, we're releasing, of course, re-releasing Fury of Dracula, and we're doing a new GW game. Uh, we have an urban uh, tactical game called Seal Team Flicks, where the dexterity element is when you uh, you know flick the uh, the ammo from the uh, the the weapons that are you using. Okay. Uh, uh, and actually, there's another game called Maiden's Quest I'm very excited about. It's, it can be played solo, at, or it can be played two or more players uh, um, uh, cooperatively or competitively, and it's portable. It's all played in your hand. Maiden's Quest. Just looking it up right now on Board Game Geek. Yes. Uh, I, I think this is going to be really, really a, a cool game. I'm, I'm very happy 
uh, and excited about this game. Also very different, which is what mm -hmm. I strive for. And uh, yeah, just something, again, you could play 30 seconds, or I'll just play one adventure, or you could play it all the way through and it might take 15, 20 minutes. You can have other people join you or fight you, uh, especially when they join, there's going to be... Um, it's called serendipity, and when someone helps you, you can give them a card. It's a gift, and you sign it, and when if you help like five people and get five different signatures, then the card okay. gives you a special ability. So really uh, cool stuff. Uh, it sounds very different. Very, very different. Uh, yeah. We also have a legacy-style game called Beyond the Edge, a sci-fi game. Uh, where you can uh, you're going to be going on missions. You can upgrade your ships, um, and the uh, so it has that element where you can upgrade and, and keep that uh, stuff permanent. But the other cool thing, like an RPG, if you want to join someone else's group, you can actually take your ship and all its cards and upgrades and everything, and go to another group and sit down and play with them using your oh. ship and everything. Nice. Uh, yeah, and, and what's also cool is you're going to see things that you didn't see in your game, and they're probably going to see things they didn't see in their game because of the way the missions branch out. You might have done different missions. Uh, and then, of course, after you finish playing with them, you can go back to your original group and say, hey, look what I got, uh, kind of thing. So I'm very excited about that as well. Yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds like my cup of tea, that one. I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye on that yeah, one. Yeah, absolutely. Now, is the Big release game. schedule for WizKids... It, it, is it throughout the year? Yeah, this is all throughout the year. We, we're releasing a bunch of games pretty much. Uh, even though Team Play came out, I think starting in uh, March, you'll see uh, uh, Dark.net and Kung Fu Zoo come out. And Kung Fu Zoo is a great family game. Uh, and then over the months, you'll see things like a Fungin Party, which is a dexterity wacky game with dice and you're, you're like bouncing dice off the table to go into do on a box. You're stacking dice on your forehead. You're uh, using <laughs> wands to manipulate dice. I mean, yeah, it's a dungeon crawl that's very, very different. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, got and uh, and a few other things uh, coming out as well. So, uh, very a lot of excited stuff. We of course we have a Magic the Gathering board game uh, we're coming out with also uh, later in the year. Uh, so very very different things. And then we'll have a Shadow Fist board game coming out next year. Hopefully. Oh man, I've been yes. wanting to do one. You don't know how long, <laughs> how long. I've seen three or four designs, but none of them really really you know excited me and now of course i don't have that license uh theoretically if someone gave me a game that i liked i'd go back and ch see if i can get the board game license to it but yes yeah. i i would have loved to have done a shadow fist board game yeah well never say never let's see uh, let's see if it happens yes yeah. right anyway thank you very much for coming on the show thanks for, and having me. for telling us everything about yourself and whiz kids and well, just all sorts of things, really. So anything else you want to add in before we think, fin finish things up? Uh, no, I think I'm good. I, I can't wait. I'll be at the UK Games Expo. So if anybody uh, wants to come visit the WizKids booth, say hello or talk or ask questions, play our games, please feel free to do so. Yeah, which is not that far away. I've got like three events between then and now, but yeah, it, that's it the comes next up big fast. one that I've got. It comes up It fast. does. <laughs> it does. So anyway, thank you very much again for joining me on the show. And uh, I'll welcome. see you soon. Thank you. Do you take care, Paul? So that's the end of this episode. I hope you've enjoyed the show as always. And thanks to everyone who submitted questions for Zev. Thanks again to GamesLaw, the UK's largest specialist games retailer, for sponsoring the show. And to Jason Shaw at audionautics.com for the music used in this podcast. Gaming Rules is a member of Punchboard Media, where we all bring something to the table and a proud supporter of the Board Game Trading and Chat UK Facebook group. So hello to everybody on that group who's listening here. And you can support me on Patreon. The page is patreon.com forward slash gaming rules. Until next time, take care and thanks for listening.